well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. We have a, a great conversation with Chuck Michelle, head of the California Rifle and Pistol Association, co-founder of the 2A Law Center, coming up here in just a moment or two. A uh, wide-ranging conversation with Chuck as well. When I uh, reached out to Chuck originally, I said, hey, why don't you come on and let's talk about uh, Kamala Harris's support for Prop H in San Francisco back in 2005. This was the uh, referendum that would have banned handguns, not only for sale in San Francisco, but would have banned the continued possession of handguns in the city. If Prop H had been allowed to go into effect, uh, not only would the sale of handguns have been prohibited inside the city limits, but every existing handgun owner would have been told to hand over their pistol to the San Francisco police. Now, the referendum passed in 2005 with 53% of the vote. Remember, this is pre-Heller, right? In fact, I think San Francisco is the last locality in the country to pass a handgun ban. It did not go into effect. In fact, uh, the California Rifle and Pistol Association, along with the NRA, challenged Prop H in court. Chuck Michelle was the lead attorney in that case and was able to defeat the handgun ban referendum and block it from going into effect. Um, I, I guess much to the chagrin of Kamala Harris since she backed the idea back in uh, 2005. But when we started talking with Chuck, um, there were another uh, number of other issues that came up. We also talked about the, the right to carry for non-residents in California. And we talked about the amicus briefs that have been filed in the challenge to Maryland's assault weapons ban, quote unquote, the assault weapons ban, Snope versus Brown. This is pending before the Supreme Court for review. The court has not accepted this case yet, hasn't rejected it either, uh, but in a fairly, uh, I don't want to say unprecedented, but fairly unusual move. Uh, almost a dozen amicus briefs have been filed with the Supreme Court urging the justices to take up the case. Typically, as Chuck says, these amicus briefs are filed after a case has been granted cert. Uh, but here you've got a number of organizations, including, by the way, 27 attorneys general, uh, the state legislatures in Wisconsin and Arizona, who are urging the court to accept this case, to hear this challenge, and to rule once and for all whether or not the Second Amendment protects commonly owned rifles, shotguns, and pistols that have been arbitrarily designated by a state as so-called assault weapons. So again, a lot to discuss with Chuck Michelle. Take a look and a listen. Chuck, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Cam. Always a pleasure. Oh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I saw your uh, post on X on Monday, um, and then Costas Morris' uh, follow-up about... Kamala Harris back in 2005, and I confess, Chuck, I had forgotten about this. I remember covering Prop H uh, because this was a year after Cam and Company first started, but I had forgotten that Kamala Harris was a supporter of this proposed handgun ban, and I'll call it confiscation. I know that uh, it, it was what? not police going door to door collecting guns, but legal handgun owners in San Francisco were told it's going to be a crime. For you to continue to possess that gun, you've got to hand them over. Uh, this was a referendum that went before San Francisco voters that ultimately passed with 53% of the vote. And Kamala Harris was a big backer of that handgun ban in 2005. She never met a gun control law she didn't like. And San Francisco was the leader. You know, at the time, NRA and CRPA had a joint local ordinance project. Because mm -hmm. back then was when the what used to be the legal community against violence was pushing local ordinances all across the state to try and defeat this preemption doctrine, which had been solidified by the courts the first time San Francisco tried to, to ban handguns. And we beat them in court then. And so then they came up with this novel legal theory to try and get around that. And, and that was Prop H. But they San Francisco has proposed every local ordinance that they could think of at the behest of the legal community against violence, now the Gifford Center. But they don't really have to do that, push that local stuff as hard anymore because they've got the Sacramento state legislature that they can just pass whatever they want there now. Yeah. But at the time, they were pushing everything across the state, box storage, uh, uh, restrictions on, uh, on ownership, all kinds of, uh, of restrictions. And San Francisco was the leader in coming up with these. And Harris supported them all. Now, the worst one was obviously Prop H, where they were actually going to ban handguns, civilian possession of handguns in the city, total ban. And she supported that. And this was controversial 
Feinstein didn't support it. Newsom didn't support it. They got barely four votes on the San Francisco uh, Board of Supervisors to put it on the ballot because the rest of the supervisors didn't support it. The law enforcement didn't support it. You know, people were against this, but Harris was supporting it along with every other harebrained scheme that San Francisco came up with. So, yeah, I hope this gets out there, you know, uh, because this is a big thing. She's such a hypocrite, you know, now saying, oh, I've got a gun. And if somebody comes in my house, I'm going to shoot them. Uh, when she was going to take that right away from everyone in the city of San Francisco. And if she could have, she would have done it across the state. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, there are her comments also when she was D.A. I think this was 2006, 2007. Uh, and it was another local ordinance, right? It was a gun storage ordinance. This one, Gavin Newsom did get behind. Uh, and that's when Kamala Harris at a press conference, Newsom was standing there, said, uh, just because you're a legal gun owner, uh, you know, it doesn't mean we can't go into your locked home uh, and inspect your firearm to make sure it's stored properly. So, I mean, the the disdain that she has displayed for the right to keep and bear arms, uh, you know, you can add the Fourth Amendment uh, to, right. I guess, uh, those enumerated right. rights that uh, Kamala Harris uh, has contempt for. And, you know, I hope people do talk about this, Chuck, because it has been infuriating to see, you know, the, 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 the fact checks from the yeah. media. Right. Oh, Kamala yeah. Harris uh, says she owns a gun. What are the facts? Well, she says she owns a gun, so it must be true. That was basically Snopes. Uh, the, the, the only evidence that Kamala Harris owns a gun is she said it, and that was good enough for Snopes. I don't even care, quite honestly, if Kamala Harris owns a gun, but I do want the media to start focusing on what she has said about your gun ownership, my gun ownership, our gun ownership. What does it mean when she says she supports the right to keep and bear arms when she has argued that the Second Amendment doesn't protect an individual right to keep and bear arms? So right. yeah, yeah, yeah. what does that mean when she says she's a Second Amendment supporter? Exactly. And that's the that's the game they play. Oh, I support the Second Amendment. Yeah. But in her mind, the Second Amendment means you can have like a single shot pistol and one bullet, you know, like Barney Fife. You get or, one. Or maybe you can carry a gun while you're serving in a militia. Right? right. Maybe maybe that's what it means. Well, or the military. I don't know about the militia, but the, I don't <laughs> think she believes in the militia. You know? uh, well, uh, yeah. Well, that well, that was the game back then. Right. Is that uh, while well, the Second Amendment protects service in a militia. Uh, the militia has been uh, uh, abrogated to the National Guard. So if you want to exercise your Second Amendment rights, join the National Guard. That was the argument pre-Heller. But, but they've, they've all played this semantics game. Oh, I support the Second Amendment. Well, in their mind, the Second Amendment means almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Essentially nothing. You, they can ban handguns. They can ban all semi-automatics and a hell of a lot more than that with the uh, so-called assault weapon characterization. So what's left? You, you can go duck hunting? I mean, you know, to her, the Second Amendment and to the progressives in general who are behind this movement, uh, and she has been a leader in it, uh, Second Amendment means nothing. So uh, I just hope this gets out. I hope some people appreciate it and it motivates some, some folks who do want to be able to choose to own a gun, either a semi-automatic or a handgun to defend themselves and their family, to get out there and vote and get other people to vote too, because we are in deep caca if Harris uh, gets uh, 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 elected, because she's going to be a sock puppet for the progressive, the most progressive side of the Democratic Party, which isn't even Democratic anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's big government socialism, basically, redistribution of wealth and DEI and all the political woke baloney that is doing our country harm, uh, mostly, uh, that, that's going to be the agenda. And she won't admit it, and she'll be hide behind her word salads and her non-responses, but that's what's coming if she gets in. Absolutely. I mean, it's why we're writing about this at Bearing Arms every day, because frankly, you know, the mainstream media, I think, is more interested in covering up Harris's record on the Second Amendment than covering uh, her record on the right to keep and bear arms. So again, I appreciate you getting the word out. And I did want to ask you about the, the legal fight over Prop H because ultimately you were successful in uh, challenging that law. Um, but again, this was pre-Heller, right? So you didn't argue necessarily a Second Amendment argument when you took on Prop H in San Francisco, but who defended Prop H? Was it Kamala Harris or was it the city attorney? 
It was the city attorney. The city attorney. Okay. Yeah, the city attorney, uh, Renee Rene. I, I, I can't remember her name. Either, but, uh, yeah, she was another right in there with uh, Camella on ideology. Uh, but yeah, thankfully we knocked that one out. That was a joint effort between NRA and CRPA at the time. And now the CRPA is basically running all these oppositions to local ordinances, which thankfully there's not as many, but you've got, you've still got San Francisco, San Jose, you know, city of LA. They want to do everything they can to restrict gun ownership at the local level. And they still try and push these local ordinances to do it. Yeah. So we're still fighting. Well, one of the fights the CRPA is engaged in is the fight over concealed carry in California um, and CRPA versus LASD. You guys are challenging the lengthy wait times in some jurisdictions, the exorbitant fees that are being charged by some licensing authorities. But you're also challenging the inability for non-residents to carry in California, because right now there is no way that somebody who lives in Arizona or Virginia or Nevada or anywhere else can get a license to carry. And the state of California doesn't recognize any out of state licenses. Um, now, I know that in this lawsuit, you argued in favor of a reciprocal agreement. Um, but in the request for an injunction, uh, in her decision, the uh, judge, uh, Sherilyn Peace Garnett, I just reread this decision earlier today, Chuck. Um, she basically just said, I'm not going to get into the privileges and immunities, uh, 14th Amendment claims. I'm not going to get into that. Yes, people's Second Amendment rights are being violated if they can't carry in California. Uh, but we're not going to talk about reciprocity. So instead, not, not, not yet, not, not yet. yet. All okay. this stuff is still on the table. But for now, all we got, and it's a it's a big thing. Eat all right. Uh, that uh, that uh, people from other states can get a California li a license to carry in California. Now we're still working out the details, and folks really need to subscribe to CRPA.org and get those. You don't have to be a member. It'd be nice if you joined or you know made a little donation, but get them get the news because we put up updates on all our cases, and all of these cases could have national significance. Just like some of the cases, like like the Bianchi case in the Supreme Court is going to have national significance and, and affect us in California. Uh, but we're working out the details on how this is work in practice. We're trying to make it as easy, as inexpensive, and as fast as possible for an out-of-state resident to apply for a California CCW. Now, some jurisdictions in California process these applications very quickly, and others like LA County Sheriff, do not, or they try and charge a lot. This is all part of the what we call the blue resistance to Bruin. Mm -hmm. They recognize they have to issue CCWs, licenses to carry in public, but they want to make it as hard as possible, as expensive as possible, and take as long as possible. And then they want to make it so that most of the state is a sensitive area where your CCW isn't valid, is right. does not entitle you to carry. Yeah. So there's all a, cons a concerted effort and an organized effort, coordinated effort, to try and make CCWs as worthless as possible so that it will discourage people from applying for one. Yeah, I was going to say, the other thing that you didn't mention is, so they want to make it, you know, uh, expensive to apply for. They want to, you know, drag out the process. But then when you get your license, they want to make it valid for as short a time as possible, right? right. So it's, it's only two years, and then you right. get a renew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I wrote about this at uh, Bearing Arms on uh, Tuesday for our VIP members. And, you know, I, I wanted to say, listen, this is a first step, right? I don't think anybody would be satisfied with the scope of this, um, but it's a crack in the door. And the most significant thing, I think, is that Judge Garnett recognized that, yes, there is a right to carry that crosses state lines, right? right? Now it's, okay, well, what does that right look like? How do we get there? But just that simple acknowledgement, Chuck, is a big win. Because, yeah. again, the anti-gunners say, no, this is the one enumerated right that stops at the border of your home state. You may right. be able to carry where you live, but once you leave uh, you know, your, your home state, now nope, there go your Second Amendment rights. That's right. Once again, the Second Amendment to them means very, very little. And Absolutely. Uh, it, 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 remember, be, after Heller, they wanted to say your Second Amendment was homebound. You, it only applied right. in your house. You know, yeah. I mean, so. And maybe you could own a gun for self-defense, right. right? Maybe you could own one firearm. We just have to keep 
fighting. We are making progress. I know it takes time. I know a lot of people are frustrated, and so am I, with how long these things are taking. But we're fighting a battle in the Ninth Circuit on all these different cases that, you know, the Ninth Circuit is, judges are fractured, split. And uh, Supreme Court's going to have to weigh in again on, on, on a number of different issues. But in the, in the meantime, we are making progress and we're working with, you know, th there's a there's a great sort of a true coalition, a, a true uh, uh, working together uh, between gun owners of California, Second Amendment Foundation, gun owners of America, even FPC. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we joined you with some Minnesota groups, Colorado. I mean, we are working with any group that believes similarly to us, Pink Pistols, Operation Blazing Sword. There, there's just so many because I think everybody has realized that we have to do that to kind of unite uh, since uh, the NRA is kind of doesn't have the finances anymore to really be as aggressive as it used to be in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it's not a zero sum game. I mean, if you donate to one of these organizations and you know, I love it if you threw a few dollars to, to CRPA, but if you donate to one of these organizations, they will help. They will, they are working with other organizations to, uh, to get the lawyers doing the things they need to do. And my law firm and I are we're proud to be a part of that. By no means are we the only gun lawyers in the, in the country. But uh, in California, we're definitely working pretty hard. Absolutely. Um, all right. One more question before we let you go. Maybe maybe one and a half questions. Um, you mentioned Bianchi earlier. That's the uh, challenge to Maryland's uh, ban on so-called Wasobans. I guess now it's Snope versus brown which always makes me think of harry potter severus snape but that's that that's not it mr bianchi has i think left the state of maryland so he can no longer be a, a plaintiff there hopefully he's in a, a friendlier state when it comes to the second amendment um but you know we also so the supreme court's got to consider granting cert to that case later this fall we also are awaiting judge mcglynn's decision in illinois in um i think it's barrett versus raul and all of the associated cases I got to say, I wasn't in the courtroom. Uh, I was relying a lot on Greg Bishop's reporting, uh, who right. was there. I feel pretty good uh, that we're going to get a, a solid decision uh, in support of our right to keep and bear arms uh, when Judge McGlynn issues his decision. I, I, I do, too. And this is a challenge to the Illinois semi-auto ban. Uh, and it just went to trial. Remember, right. we, we got a preliminary injunction from Judge McGlynn originally. That was overturned by the Seventh Circuit, primarily Judge Easter, Easterbrook. Uh, it, it, but they said, you know, there, there's some facts we don't know. So they sent it back down to develop these facts. They tried to draw a bright line between, actually to, to blur the line between what they characterized as military, exclusive military use firearms and civilian use firearms. They tried to say, AR-15s are close enough to M-16s, so you can ban them all. So. Uh, there was a lot of factual issues, and we were kind of, we had to go by the test that the Seventh Circuit set up. But that 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 trial, that court trial in front of Judge McGlynn, there was no jury, uh, just took place last week. And the nice thing is, here's what happens when you get a judge who knows about guns. And the Southern District of Illinois is a fairly rural area. So there's hunters and, you know, there's ranges, you know, people, people know, uh, but Judge McGlynn probably knows more than some of these experts about guns. And when he's listening to this stuff, he's actually asking questions that reflect that he has this knowledge and he can call BS on some of the stuff that the anti-gun lobby, uh, anti-gun owner lobby uh, puts out there. So we're very hopeful that he, he will see through this stuff and he will take the Seventh Circuit's decision in mind and apply the rules that they are forcing him to apply, but still nonetheless find that this ban is a Second Amendment violation. Yeah. So that's, you know, the, the, that Illinois case, but 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 if Snopes slash Bianchi gets accepted and, and the Second Amendment Law Center and CRPA and Minnesota groups and, and, and a whole bunch of groups uh, have submitted amicus briefs asking the court to take the case. Remember, usually there's a two rounds of briefing. There's a petition for cert where so the parties file and ask the Supreme Court to hear the case. And if the Supreme Court votes to hear it, then you have another round of substantive briefing on the merits. And then they have an oral argument and then they issue a decision. Well, in this case, and, and usually 
People don't bother submitting amicus briefs at the petition stage where you're first trying to get the court to hear the case. Mm -hmm. we, we submitted one, Illinois submitted one, the FFL Illinois, the, the Second Amendment Defense and Education Coalition, uh, Gun Save Life, uh, the Second Amendment Foundation in their case, Gun Owners of America, Gun Owners of California, all of us are submitting amicus briefs asking the court to take this case and pointing to what the California courts are doing. So we had the, all the parties in the Duncan case joined a, an amicus petition, all the parties in the Illinois case pointing to what the courts are doing in these other states and saying, this Maryland case gives you the opportunity to set the record straight all across the country. So Supreme Court, please take this case and 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 tell the, the states that are trying to ban the commonly owned most effective firearms for sport, self-defense, multiple other uses uh, from civilian possession. You got to put a stop to this. Absolutely. Because that was the Fourth Circuit's argument as well, right? Essentially that these are arms that are not protected by the Second Amendment because they're like machine guns. Um, and I thought, again, the, the, the plaintiffs in uh, the Illinois case did a fantastic job of laying out the substantive differences between the arms that are carried by the military, the arms that are available to civilians. Uh, in fact, even getting, I think, one of these state's witnesses to uh, to say uh, he's not in favor of a ban. Right. Uh, he owns one of these uh, items. Uh, he owns multiple 30 round magazines, I believe he said as well. Uh, and he, while well, he said, well, you know, the military really doesn't use full auto. He could not explain why the military most recently adopted a rifle that has select fire and full auto functions, not just a semi-automatic rifle. Um, so I, I think, you know, the arguments are being made, as you say, not just at the Supreme Court, but all around the country that know this idea that the most popular rifles in the country are not protected by the Second Amendment, that they are to uh, akin to machine guns, which, again, is a whole different topic. We can talk about the constitutionality of machine guns at some point. But right now, we're dealing with the constitutionality of semi-automatic rifles. Right. Those, that's um, what the cases involve now. Yeah. And and so, you know, again, I, I just thought it was a um, I thought it was a fantastic job uh, in Illinois of uh, explaining this. And hopefully the Supreme Court is going to be able to uh, take a, a read at Judge McGlynn's opinion, uh, in addition to these amicus briefs, because I think what the state of Maryland is due with their reply brief. Do you know when the court is scheduled to take up Snopen conference? Is it uh, going to well, be they, October? They, they they will start having, you know, they go back in session the first Monday in October. So yeah. They'll start scheduling these cases for conferences once they're back in session. But you, you don't you don't know when exactly they're going to set it for conference until they do. Yeah. OK, but Maryland has is Maryland through with its brief in reply to the cert petition or it, does it still have some time? Uh, I, I think it might have a little actually, bit of time. I think they still have to do their brief. They still yeah. Have to, but actually, they, they, they may not. What usually happens is the Supreme Court and I forgive me, I'm not totally up to speed on the procedural status of this case. Usually what happens is a, a party petitions for cert and the opposing party doesn't bother to oppose it because usually they're denied with a one line sentence. So if the Supreme Court says, hey, we want to hear from you, that means the Supreme Court has some interest. So I'm not sure if they have ordered Maryland to respond to this yet. OK, OK. And you got to right. you got to fact check that and, 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 and let your listeners know, because I just. I have a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah. Juggling a lot of cases. Uh, you and me both, buddy. <laughs> you and me both. Uh, well, listen, as always, I appreciate you setting some light on uh, these particular cases, uh, CRPA versus LESD, uh, as well as some of the other cases that we talked about. And, of course, uh, Kamala Harris's long history of attacking our right to keep and bear arms. Uh, Chuck, thank you again for everything you do. Always enjoy spending some time with you. and I look forward to doing it again very soon. Always a pleasure, Cam. Thanks for having me. Thanks for getting the word out. My thanks to Chuck for coming on the show. By the way, we have a link to all of the amicus briefs uh, at bearingarms.com. I've got a, a post that uh, went up this morning, uh, specifically looking at the brief that was uh, authored by uh, Chuck and uh, uh, attorney Anna Bevere with the Michelin Associates. Uh, this was filed, as Chuck mentioned, on behalf of CRPA, the 2A Law Center, uh, Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois, Pig Pistols, Operation Blazing Sword, and the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I think that's all of them with that amicus brief. But again, you can find the other nine amicus briefs that have been filed 
uh, at Bearing Arms as well. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, a case out of Colorado. The New York Post reporting the uh, Trin de Aragua gangbanger charged over the viral video of gun toting migrants terrorizing Aurora, Colorado. After local cops initially denied that the group was part of the Venezuelan gang. You have seen this video, I am sure, of these uh, individuals uh, strolling around an apartment uh, complex in Aurora, Colorado, all of them uh, armed uh, with rifles. And again, the allegation that they've basically taken over this apartment building. Now, we've seen some people push back and there's, oh, no, 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 they're, they're not a Venezuelan gang. Oh, no, 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 no. The, uh, uh, the, the apartment building is just fine, right? It's not unsafe at all. Well, according to the New York Post, police in Aurora, Colorado, now charged three suspects who were featured in this viral video. Uh, And one of the men has now admitted that he is, in fact, a member of that violent Venezuelan gang, Trinde Aragua. Um, That's according to federal law enforcement sources who told the New York Post that he had confessed to being a member of this gang, despite, as the Post says, local cops saying that none of the men were connected to that criminal organization. According to the New York Post, 20-year-old Nifrid Serpa Acosta Uh, confessed during an interview with immigration authorities after he was asked if he had any gang affiliation by immigration officers. He also has uh, Trendy Aragua's signature crown tattoo uh, inked on his body, which is another indication. And as the New York Post writes, all three of the individuals who have been arrested have lengthy rap sheets in Colorado, even though they are all here in this country Illegally, apparently, uh, the New York Post reports that the two other suspects, uh, Anderson Zambrano Pacheco, who's 25, 21-year-old Naudi Lopez Fernandez, uh, both crossed the border illegally last year, and they were quickly released into the United States. Um, according to the New York Post, the pair also had multiple arrests in Colorado since they entered this country illegally. Uh, but the Post says there is no confirmed evidence that they are members of the gang, at least not yet. Now, Acosta has been arrested at least three times in Colorado over the past two years, according to law enforcement sources, first arrested in June of 2023 for theft, then in April of this year for theft, and then the following month, May of 2024, for theft, resisting arrests and obstructing a police officer. New York Post says it's unclear why he was let go each time. Oh, I know why. Because of Colorado's soft on crime policies. I mean, Democrats in Colorado, we've talked about this before. They are loath to put criminals behind bars. Colorado Democrats objected to a bill that would have increased the punishment for stealing a firearm from a misdemeanor to a felony precisely for that reason. There was analysis showing that uh, raising the penalty from a misdemeanor to a felony would have incarcerated more people. And Colorado Democrats said, no, we're not going to do that. So it doesn't surprise me that despite multiple arrests, this individual was quickly put back out of the streets. Uh, particularly, again, given that these arrests were at least the first two times for nonviolent offenses, just theft, right? I'm surprised they didn't give him the key to the city, quite frankly. According to New York Post, Acosta initially entered the U.S. by crossing the border into El Paso, Texas, illegally in December of 2022. He then volunteered to leave, turned back to Mexico. It's not clear when he re-entered the United States, but again, he did not do so legally. Uh, Acosta currently in ICE custody and is uh, set to appear before an immigration judge later today. New York Post reports that the three other people seen in that viral video have uh, yet to be identified. They are believed to be at large. Um, On to today's armed citizen story. A uh, rather bizarre and troubling story out of the Philadelphia area. CBS in Philadelphia reporting a man shot and arrested after following a woman home from a casino, then breaking into her home and assaulting her. Now, this is not the first time that we've heard about people, you know, who've left a casino. They've been trailed and then they've been, you know, accosted, assaulted, robbed in the driveway of their home or even inside their home. Um, but thankfully, in this case, there was an individual inside that home who was willing and able to act to defend the woman who was being assaulted. Uh, police in Abington, I believe that Abington, Maryland, identified the uh, man allegedly involved in the home invasion as a Kabir Shepherd. Authorities have charged Shepherd with robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, and carrying a firearm without a license. Hey, go figure. According to police, it was about to 1 o'clock Monday morning. Authorities responded to a report of a home invasion in Abington once they arrived there. They met with a woman who told them that she had just gotten home from a casino when an unknown man forced his way inside her home, then pointed a gun at her. The man, identified by police as Khalid Shepard, or Kabir Shepard, rather, allegedly pushed the woman to the ground, then grabbed her purse that was sitting on the dining room table. The woman yelled out for help. Her son was asleep in the back bedroom. 
According to authorities, he grabbed his legally owned gun, then ran out into the living room to see what was going on. After the son saw that Shepard was armed, he fired two shots at Shepard in defense of his mother's safety. The bullets hitting Shepard in the back and the arm, but then ran out of the home before he collapsed on the front lawn, according to police. And that's when police arrived at the residence and took Shepard into custody. Authorities say that a handgun believed to be Shepard's also found on the front lawn. Uh, according to CBS in Philadelphia, after he was arrested, authorities took Shepard to the hospital for his gunshot wounds. He was arraigned and remanded to the Montgomery County Correctional Facility, uh, where he is uh, being held on $250,000 cash bail. Having in township, police chief Patrick Malloy said, we do know the suspect was watching her. She was targeted. This wasn't a random crime. They knew that there was cash in that purse. I said this might have been happening in Maryland, uh, which is northern Maryland, but I guess this is Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, so there must be a Hammond Township there in the uh, Philadelphia suburbs as well. Uh, Malloy added, uh, I'd say if you are at a casino and you win money, take some precautions. There are bad guys who put a lot of work into this. Listen, it's good advice, but, you know, at the same time, what exactly are you supposed to do? You know, most casinos, I mean, listen, you know, have your head on a swivel, uh, right? But most casinos prohibit firearms from being carried inside. So even if you have a concealed carry license, you're not allowed to bring the gun to the casino. You may not be allowed to actually store that firearm on casino property. So you might not even be able to lock it up in your car. Um, It is troubling. And again, I think that thieves are exploiting that fact, right? Knowing that they are more likely to have an unarmed victim than somebody who is able to protect themselves from a a robbery. Thankfully, again, in this case, the uh, robber chose a victim whose son happened to be a legal gun owner and was in a position to save his mom's life and her winnings from the casino. Uh, Finally, our good deed of the day. I love this story. This is such a great story. From uh, the Worcester Telegram and Gazette in Massachusetts, Shrewsbury, Mass., Van Ha... Uh, go shopping every week, but this time around, she lost about $12,000 in cash somewhere during her uh, weekly shopping trip to the bar- uh, Market Basket in Shrewsbury. She called her nephew, Trong Huan, for help. They drove back to the grocery store. They were looking for that envelope. Uh, Dan DeFossis is the manager there. He spoke with them in the uh, parking lot. He said, listen, we'll go through the security cameras and see you know, if there's any footage of you dropping this envelope uh, as you're either inside the store or on your way inside the store. They were able to find footage of Van Ha getting out of her car and walking into the store, but it didn't show her dropping anything. Uh, DeFossa says, I took down their name and number. I said I'd call them if anything turned up. And he said, when I walked back into the store, there was a gentleman standing at the service counter with the cash. That's right. And there's the headline. Good Samaritan finds $12,000 in cash in a market basket parking lot and returns it to the owner. The uh, man, identified only by his first name of Skip, uh, is described as a regular shopper. He uh, rushed outside with the Fosses and caught the family before they had a chance to leave. Uh, Huynh said, we were about to leave when the manager came over to us with a man named Skip. He had found the money. We were so happy. Uh, he said that the money meant to support their family, saying in some cultures it's not uncommon, and with some generations, it's not uncommon for people to carry large sums of cash with them. Uh, Hoon said, we were so excited, we left right away, we went home without even thinking about it, but then we wanted to thank Skip, so we went back to the market basket with a reward. Skip at that point had left, but his girlfriend works at the store, so she was able to take the reward that was uh, offered to Skip. Uh, Hoon wrote on social media, it takes a special kind of person. To do something so honest and selfless. And Skip, you are a true example of integrity and compassion. Thank you, Skip. You have touched more lives than you know today. The Fossus said Skip's actions. He said, so very nice. He said, I don't know a lot of people who would have done that. I mean, just finding a bank teller envelope, no name on it, you know. I I mean, I confess when I think about (laughs) all the work that I need to have done to my house and what $12,000 would do. Uh, just to improve my life, I, I, you know, I would wrestle with that. I'd like to think that it would be an easy decision for me to say, well, listen, this money doesn't belong to me. It belongs to somebody. And I know that somebody's missing this $12,000. I'd like to think that I would do the right thing. But I don't think that it would have been quite as a uh, easy decision for me as it was for Skip. So uh, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. There's Skip on the left. A good man. 
helping out a, a family in need and returning the uh, cash that they were missing dearly. A uh, tip of the hat to Skip there in Massachusetts for his very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program, as always. Looking forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow. And uh, don't forget to check out Bearing Arms. In the meantime, we are keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. We are fact-checking the fact-checkers when it comes to Kamala Harris and her gun control plans. It is amazing to me how the media is covering up what Harris has said about the Second Amendment and your right to keep and bear arms as opposed to covering what she has said over the years. But again, it's that media bias that we are fighting each and every day at Bearing Arms. I would encourage you to uh, help support us if you can by becoming a VIP or VIP Gold member. All you have to do is go to BearingArms.com slash subscribe, use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, and you get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. And yes, you will be helping us fight big tech censorship. You will be helping us fight the rampant media bias when it comes to our Second Amendment rights. And that help is greatly appreciated. So thank you again. Have a great rest of your hump day Wednesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well. Be safe. Be safe.